we had to zap you twice. If that one doesn't work, we have to go with the other option, which is a main line direct to your heart. Oh no, Hunter, I couldn't have did all that. You brave. Guess why they call you the game, huh? <laughs> Alright, it's not funny. Let's continue. So I have a defibrillator in my chest, um, which clearly is why I'm not wrestling. It's why, uh, well, anyway. When they came to me and then said, it's done, I bet that's a rush, right? Like, I wish I was out there for that. That'd be cool, but not really. You know, if they tell you you're going to die on Tuesday, no one is going to go, well, shh, a board meeting on Friday. Right. Right? It's irrelevant. I love being a part of creating the magic of what we do in WWE for people all around the world, for kids, for for everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to bring you this interview, Triple H Levette, a heartfelt interview on why he will never wrestle in the WWE ring again. I was doing a little research and I read up that it occurred around September, something like that. First is when my health issue happened, yeah. So what's the situation, Paul? Yeah, so look, uh, I've, I've talked about it a little bit, but the, the truth is, you know, I had a genetic heart issue that, that led to me having a blockage. Um, the rest of my heart was pristine and clean, and the, I had a, a blockage in my uh, the main artery that they call your widow maker, 99%. So I had been running myself the normal schedule, right? I had had like a 10-day run between SummerSlam and from Orlando to Vegas and Vegas to L.A. and back and, you know, all over the place, and it had been a crazy run. When we came back in at the end, I was in Orlando for television, uh, for NXT, and the last couple of days that I was there, I was getting run down and sick. And I knew I was, I could feel it coming on. I'm thinking like, oh God. So when I flew home, I went to get tested for COVID because I certainly didn't want to bring that home to my kids, even though I'd been vaccinated and even though I'd had it and, and everything else, I didn't want to bring that home to my kids. And I didn't have it. I was, uh, they said I had viral pneumonia and you know my i was super congested but i was exhausted and um it sort of kept getting worse my doctor kept a, a very close eye on it and was like man there's you know your heart rate's elevated there's just certain things going on here um there's a certain point in time where my you know i'm coughing stuff up my wife sees it she sees a little bit of blood and she's like i don't like that and one day after i get a bunch of tests done i get home and uh i get a call that uh, my doctor and he says, uh, hey, plans on the ground have changed. I need you to put a few things into a bag. Don't waste time. I need you to drive to Yale. And I go, dude, <laughs> like you're making this sounds like this is life or death. What is going on? He goes, you're in heart failure. I don't smoke. I don't anything like I'm about as crystal clean as you can get. Right. They finally check us in. We get in there. So now it's early evening. I check in. They start to run all the tests. And when I get the first test back, my now my ejection fracture is at 22. Ultrasound, a bunch of other stuff. They basically come back and say, your ejection fracture is now 12. We need to go now. During the process, as I'm recovering from this, they had me wearing a, a defibrillator vest as a precaution because I had cascaded so low, all this other stuff. And, and meanwhile, everything else now, my the rest of my heart looks great. Everything else is this one thing. And they're like, you know, when they get into my family history, they're like, Wow, genetically, my dad's had triple bypass. My grandfather died young, heart disease. I, we didn't know this until I, I literally found out like two weeks prior that his dad, my great grandfather, had died at uh, 52, heart failure. Look at the time, they didn't just drop dead walking, right? Um, they didn't know. So it's like a genetic thing that you're predisposed to. And this is how they explained it to me. They said, look, if we put this in, best case scenario is we put this in, you come back to us. 30 years from now and you go like this thing never went off once wasted my time you guys put this in my chest i didn't need it you wasted my time and they go like oh, that's okay the other side is we don't put it in five years from now you drop dead and your wife comes back to us and go wow my husband died and he's like wow we should have put a defibrillator in you know because we don't know you don't fit in a category yeah but hunter you know them hospitals be wanting money but i understand your decision let's continue um i had a seven and a half hour surgery first day um full of complications and it didn't work oh. and how they find out that it doesn't work is they give you a v-fib attack and then if the machine doesn't rectify it they have to zap you back oh. and right so seven and a half hours when i wake up they're like yeah no seven and a half hours uh we had to zap you twice and unfortunately it didn't work so tomorrow we have to go back in try to reposition it and if that one doesn't work we have to go with the other option which is a main line direct to your heart oh no oh no hunter i couldn't have did all that you brave Guess why they call you the game. <laughs> All right, it's not funny. Let's continue. I go in the next day, eight hours of surgery. Next day, uh, same issues. Second, first one still doesn't work. They have to go back, take all that stuff out, start over, put a new one in, mainline it. Huge process. But, you know, 15 plus hours of surgery in two consecutive days with all this 
digging. And it, and it was all stuff like I'm too vascular from years of training. My fascial tissue is too thick. The digging is incredibly difficult. Like it just all these little things. And I just did like every issue they could have had. I had pick my kids up every day, like spend time with them every single day on, on, on some matter. I wouldn't change that for anything. It was the best time in the world, but um, I was out out. I didn't watch the show. So I have a defibrillator in my chest, um, which clearly is why I'm not wrestling. It's why, uh, well, anyway, would never wrestle again, which a lot of people ask me about. Was I upset about that? The answer is no. You know, when they told me, I was like, okay. Like it wasn't, you know, and I think Steph took it way harder than I did. The difference to me in the business when I was wrestling, when I was an in-ring performer, um, it's like saying the success that you have you're very proud of, and it's why you do what you do. You love what you do. But when your kids get, get on, older you and you begin to watch them do the things that they love and succeed at it, your level of pride for them will be, that's almost more rewarding than your career was for you. I feel that for these, you know, for the time when I was doing it at NXT. This, I'll feel it Saturday. There'll be 60,000 plus people there, right? I'm going to watch Liv Morgan and, and Shayna. I'm going to watch... Gunther and I watch Drew McIntyre and Roman. I'm going to know what they're going through. I'm going to know how we got them there, the help to get them there, and giving them that platform to do what they do and succeed at it and live that that dream. To me, it's like watching my kids succeed at something that they've always dreamed about doing. The level of passion and pride in that is the same for me. So I, I don't need that outlet. But when they came to me and then said, "This done," the way it wasn't. There's no. I have no regrets. No sadness. No. Um, you know, people talk about like, oh, I wish I could be at peace with the way I went on. Like, I'm totally, um, I have no, it's not a part of me that goes like, oof. You know, and maybe I'll stand at the curtain Saturday, 60,000 people going crazy and go like, oof. I bet that's a rush, right? Like, I wish I was out there for that. That'd be cool, but not really, you know. It's funny. Um, I get emotional thinking about it. In some way, it's a gift to look at your life through those eyes. If they tell you, you're going to die on Tuesday. No one is going to go, well, sh a board meeting on Friday. Right. Right? It's irrelevant. I love what I do. I love the passion that it brings out of me. I love, I love all of it. I love creating this. Uh, I love being a part of creating the magic of what we do in WWE for people all around the world, for kids, for, for everybody that enjoys it. It's my passion in life, but it's doesn't compare to my passion for my kids or my wife. When it's all said and done, Triple H had a great career. And no matter how many other players change, he still remains the game. For this full interview, check out TNT Sports. Special thanks to WWE, TNT, and TKO. We on the road to WrestleMania. You got your seatbelt on? No? That's cool. Because we into putting bodies through windshields anyway. Yo, Cody. It's time to finish your story, but the bloodline will continue. They can think that they won't. Ride with me on this road to WrestleMania 40.